Welcome to Visionaries Global Media, your number one source for podcasting entertainment. Visionaries Global Media, envisioning excellence on a global scale. This is Band from Ringside. Tonight on the Band from Ringside podcast, we review and recap the TakeOver In Your House event from last week. We also have the New Japan Cup coming up. Thank God. We talk about the Wednesday Wednesday Night Wars, and we also give you our backlash predictions. That and a whole bunch more tonight on the Band from Ringside podcast. Also, that's it. No jokes. You know, I got jokes this week. <laughs> Ditch that nine to five. It's time to feel alive. Hello, Mark. So welcome to the Band from Ringside podcast. As always, I'm your host, Bill Vakey, a.k.a. Randy Borton. And over there in Edwardsville, Illinois, we have Two Beer, Zach Bowen. What's going on, Two Beer? What'd you say? I didn't catch the AKA. What was it? Uh, it was Randy Borton. Like yeah, like he's boring. Was very good. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You sound like Tommaso Champa. I was just getting ready to say. <laughs> Wait, what does Tommaso Champa sound like? Oh, they're having like a little Twitter feud. Uh, Randy or Tommaso said that uh, he couldn't get his newborn daughter to sleep or his young daughter to sleep, so he just put on some Randy Orton matches. And <laughs> he went out like a light. <laughs> And then Randy Orton started in with uh, talking about thigh slaps, like uh, you know, it was it was pretty nonsensical. It was pretty much the classic uh, thing that Vince doesn't want you to do, which is like book a feud if you're not going to deliver on the feud, right? Uh, so that's that's what they were doing. They're probably both just at home drinking. And over there at University City, St. Louis, welcome back to Jason Cornelius Bell. What's going on, JCB? Allow us to bow our heads as I read from the Band from Ringside podcast, volume 159, chapter 3, verse 14. And the good spark saith, hashtag who the heels. It is all good, baby. Listen, share, subscribe, repeat. Shout out to my girl, Becky Balboa. I love you, babe. Thanks for a good time this weekend. Um, Everything you guys said about Black Lives Matter last week, uh, I couldn't have said it any better myself, so no need to beat that down any more than it's already been done it's good to be back um, phrasing phrasing <laughs> <laughs> i didn't say that well, I, I wanted to say something else but I, I stuck to beat down instead um it's just good to be back uh, good to talk some wrestling with you guys you guys did a great last week like i, was, I said earlier um the drops caught me by surprise because when you did the first one, I, my mouth went agape and I looked at Rebecca. I was like, how the fuck did they do that shit? <laughs> so, no, it was well done. I was caught off guard and great show as always. And I'm just glad to be back. Like I said, well, we're glad to have you. I'm coming at you from sunny, beautiful South St. Louis. Uh, there's actually a bunch of stuff to talk about. We're going to be skipping our takeover do over this week because we have an actual takeover to talk about um jason how was your trip uh the trip was solid uh was, was there like five days uh didn't do much uh they're pretty much locked down like we are but uh, a couple of their one of their major malls open one of their casinos were open but there was major protests going on so that was basically the uh the story of seattle while i was up there but like i said it, me and Rebecca had a good time. We needed it. We hadn't seen each other since February, so Man, it was, uh, Seattle had some gnarly protests too. Yeah, it was, it was, it was getting it off. <laughs> yeah, what it cost you to fly up there? Like twenty bucks? Yeah, I wish it was twenty bucks, but it was pr- pretty cheap. They did um, all aisles and window seats. Nothing in the middle, unless you were like a family of four or whatever. At that point, they sat the the kids in the middle. Um, it was it was like a regular flight. That way, the airports were pretty much dead because a lot of the, uh, the businesses, restaurants, stuff like that still aren't open here and in Seattle. Um, it's, it's a new world order. It's, it's the best way I can describe it. Uh, Jason, tell us about F&B Eatery, then we'll get into it. F&B Eatery on the corner of 3453 Southampton, Southampton and Marquette. Uh, like I said, always check them out on social media. They, they have specials more times than not. 
hours of operation might change, obviously because of the still ongoing COVID situation that we have going, they will do curbside. So if you don't want to sit down, have something to eat, you can grab it to go, keep the wife and kids happy. Kids menu, beer to go, all that good stuff. Obviously the best smash burger that you probably never heard of until now. F&B Eatery, corner of 3453 South Hampton and Marquette. Tell them that Bam from Ringside sent you. Okay, and before we get into the three count, uh, you know, Bo, his family is out of town this week. So Bo, a.k.a. Vice, is having a good time. So I wasn't going to bother him because I think he's out golfing. So he didn't give me the a.k.a., which is why I came up with Randy Borton kind of on the fly, which is probably why it was a dud. That's why I need Bo. And then Bo just texts me, so I'm going to do it over. I'm going to say, a.k.a. smart for death. And uh, let's get into that. Three counts. One, two, That's like another pod. three. Right? <laughs> oh, yeah, it's off to a better start. Uh, yeah, I was going to say copyright infringement. What's the one count, Jason? Oh, uh, shit. The dream is over. We're going back to NXT TakeOver in your house. Uh, that, to me, was the biggest takeaway, even though it wasn't the main event. It was another episode, another installment of a cinematic match. Um, obviously, I shouldn't say obviously. Apparently, Jeremy Borash, Triple H, and I can't think of the third person were involved in making this uh, cinematic match. So if you liked it, didn't like it, uh, those are the people to blame. For me, this is a huge hit on Velveteen Dream status, at least on NXT. And for me, moving forward, kind of projecting him on the main roster, whether it's Raw or SmackDown. If there was a chance for him to win the title, this was it, considering the stipulation labeled on the match and the history leading up to the match. So to watch him lose and lose clean was a tad surprising, a little disappointing. Um, I'm not going to make this a race issue where Velveteen's black, so we're holding him down. I just think this is more of a maybe just not ready issue, uh, bad timing issue. Uh, Karrion Cross is now looking like he's going to be that next guy, that's probably my second biggest takeaway from it was I'll use the word squash in quotations because I don't think at this point you can truly squash Tomasa Champa. But if you could, that was pretty much the closest way you could do it. It gave me Brock Lesnar, John Cena vibes without, you know, really any color going into it. Outside of that, that was, those are my two biggest takeaways. The takeover itself was average above average at best it wasn't the takeovers i'm used to maybe this is just a sign of things in transition where we we might go down the line obviously eo shirai winning the title is important but for me it wasn't the most important thing because obviously i didn't expect her to win and i think it would have been more impactful with it being a singles match where that way she wouldn't have been pitting Rhea Ripley and Charlotte has nothing to do with it. She skates away Scott Queen, or Scott Free, but neither here nor there. We can break that down. But like I said, to me, the two biggest takeaways, the biggest is Velveteen Dream's career in NXT is in some serious trouble. And the second biggest takeaway is the quote unquote quote squash of Tommaso Ciampa. Like I said, I don't think you can squash him, but they made Kyrian Cross look really, really strong in doing so. So take it for what it's worth. Two beer. Yeah, I uh, agree with uh, Jason. I'm not as worried about Dream so much. Uh, he's young. He's got a lot of potential and a lot of time to get better, and a lot of time to, to work and, you know, quote-unquote developmental. But um, my biggest takeaway was if you would have told me that Johnny Gargano was going to have his worst takeover match ever and it was going to be with Keith Lee, no way I would have believed you. But uh, – I didn't like that match because it was like, I don't like that tiny heel, big baby face. It doesn't work. That psychology doesn't work for me uh, at all. Um, but uh, overall, it was a fine takeover. I was glad to watch it. I was glad to have it to watch and enjoy a, a few hours of entertainment. Um, but that's really all it was. It didn't do a whole lot uh, besides 
really set up Karrion Cross. Uh, I think he's going to be the next guy. I think he's going to be the guy to take this from Adam Cole. And uh, EO got her win, which was very surprising. Uh, I'm down with it. She's the best uh, women's wrestler in WWE, one of the best wrestlers in the world. Uh, she deserves this. The only problem is it never should have been taken from Rhea Ripley, Rhea Ripley at WrestleMania. So now you have this whole convoluted mess. I'm more worried about Rhea Ripley than I am about Velveteen Dream uh, because Rhea Ripley is just going to get lost in the shuffle here when she should actually be a beacon of light and a total, like, the women's vision should be focused around her right now. And um, it's not. So, But it was a, it was a fine show. I really liked the, the gimmicks, the sight gags. Todd Pettengill, oh my God, blast from the past. <laughs> also, if you would have told me that Todd Pettengill uh, if you would have been like, hey, remember Todd Pettengill? I'd have been like, yeah. I'd be like, yeah, you know that he has more personality than anybody on the entire WWE announced team? I'd be like, no way. But he totally does. Like, <laughs> because they're all just robots. Except for maybe Maro. But, you know. Uh, anyway, it was, it was fine. Wow. Okay. Uh, I'm way higher on this pay per view than either one of you guys. Starting off, were you I, way higher than us whenever you watched it? I was, but then, but then, <laughs> impossible. Well, yeah, I don't know about Jason, but uh, impossible. But I, re- I didn't like that. I didn't like that uh, backyard, not backyard, backlot match. I didn't like it at all. I thought it sucked. Um, I thought it was good. You guys totally skipped over what might have been the best match of the night, which was Finn Balor versus Damian Priest, which was a, a really great match. I had a lot of fun with that. The Keith Lee versus Gargano. Um, I get what you're saying, Zach, about little little heel versus big face. Um, but he Gargano's such a great heel, and there was a lot of good t- storytelling in that match. I mean, I, I really liked it when Keith Lee was going to get counted out, and then Gargano went in and pled with the referee to stop the count. I thought that there, I you know, I don't mind him trying to walk through the door in the in your house and being locked out. I don't know. I mean, you're right. It wasn't his best match, and I might not be in, as high on Keith Lee as a lot of other people are, but I enjoyed it. The backlot brawl, I liked it a lot. Um, I, I rewatched the pay per view today uh, because of what Zach just mentioned. I liked it better. I liked it better the second time. I liked it better today when I watched it. And I I liked that Karrion Cross went over huge on Ciampa, despite me being a big Ciampa guy. I think if you're going to bring a guy in like that and you want to make a splash and you want to put him over, you have him go after the best baby face on the brand. You know, maybe Finn Balor, but you have him go after Tommaso Ciampa. You have him pick on his surgically repaired neck, which Mauro Ranallo did a fantastic job of putting over and selling for the match. Ciampa was obviously great in that match. I, I like Cross. And I thought the Io Shirai, Rhea Ripley, Charlotte Flair match was borderline great. So I put it as a way above average takeover. I mean, it sucks that it's not in front of anybody. Obviously, that's a bummer. And it would have been better in front of a crowd. That would have been a hot as fuck main event. And that Damian Priest Finn Balor match would have been hot as fuck too. So I was real happy with it. Um like Zach said Can I say something real quick? Sure. I gotta push back on the the rear Ripley comment that Two Beer just made. If we're gonna make if we're gonna say that Velveteen Dream has time, Rear Ripley is younger. She definitely has time. There's not a lot of really big names in the women's division, even when Charlotte was there. I mean, Rhea Ripley is going to be at the top of this list. Now with Velveteen Dream, this feels different just because now, as long as Adam Cole is champion, he's not getting a chance. He's already been the North American champion. I mean, so what? Now him and Dexter Loomis are going to be tag team champions? I mean, we haven't even... I had a discussion of why they're even, you know, remotely buddy buddy at this point. I mean, oh, I they guess should be main... nowhere near each other because that that Dexter Loomis is like a death gimmick, and he does not need to be rubbing off on Velveteen Dream. Like that is, you're right about that. That's that's bad news. If, if they're going to keep that going, I am worried about Velveteen Dream. <laughs> and it seems like that's going to go for a little bit, at least for you know the next couple of weeks or so. 
I guess my biggest problem with the, the takeover itself is the convoluted storylines leading into the takeover. Okay. The triple threat didn't need to be a triple threat. They did it because they, they felt like they had to do it. You could have did EO versus Charlotte or e Charlotte versus Rhea easily and had that as a, a possible main event. I get why they did it. They didn't have to do it. The they did it. They did it because Cole. they didn't want Charlotte taking the pin. And that's fine. I, I understand that. Cole and Dream is another great example of just convoluted storylines. They could have pulled the trigger. They didn't. They didn't. And then, you know, allegedly he slid into some DMs doing some shit he ain't got no business doing. And then he missed his chance again. So, I mean, I get where Zach is coming from. But, I mean, if we're giving Velveteen Dream a pass, we got to give Rhea Ripley a pass too. I do think that if uh, one way that you can rehab Ripley, because she definitely needs some rehabbing, is. You know, Triple H after this show said, you know, yeah, this might not seem like ideal right now. He's like, but it's a longer term like storyline. If Rhea, if Charlotte goes up to the back of the main roster, wins the title and Rhea wins a main roster title from Charlotte, then that's fine. Then that's like then I can eat my words. Right. Because uh, that's like bigger and it's a bigger payoff for her. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, it's just it's just a bummer. I'm still mad about that WrestleMania booking. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, we talked about this. That had to do with that had to do with uh, legal status and being in the country. Like she had it to go back. Actually, no, that was debunked. That was not a thing. Yeah. Oh, uh, people the... trying to grasp at straws to figure out why the booking was so bad, uh, but it was not really a thing. Oh, then I don't understand that either. Um, the th I, but I will say that I'm not worried about Dream or Rhea Ripley. Uh, because they're both super young, and they were both just in championship matches less than four days ago. So, I mean, I think both of them will be all right. Uh, what you guys Wait, think about the Damien? That's good. Thank you. Thanks for giving me some grounding. Thank you. You guys need to be grounded, both of you. Um, what yeah, you guys? Man. What you guys think about the Damian Priest Finn Balor match? That was real good. It was a little scary sometimes. But it was real good. Um. I like the match. I just I kind of thought that this might have been a chance to put Damian Priest over because I mean at this point Finn Balor on the NXT roster is is pretty Teflon. So I mean if you wanted to kind of push Damian Priest forward as you know an emerging heel, I felt like this was a chance to do it. The match was good. The finish wasn't a surprise. The bump off of the ring apron onto the steel, steel steps. That's a nasty that bump. Big, yeah, I think he kind of missed that bump, and instead of hitting it in the middle of the steps, he hit it towards the edge or whatever. That looked a little rough, but there wasn't, for me, there wasn't a really standout match that separated themselves above all others. A lot of the matches were good. None were really great, where I was like, oh, I gotta watch this again. It's oh, I thought like Tika Knox came out looking real good. That opening six women tag, like uh, that, I like that way more than I thought I would whenever it started. No, uh, I agree with that too. Yeah, I really like Tika Knox in general, but I think she really came off really nicely in this. And uh, I think if they give her a push, and her and Io could have a really good match. Uh, you guys are going to be surprised at this, but I really like the triple threat. I really thought it was good. <laughs> I mean, I like I know that it's a joke and it's been a joke for the duration of the podcast, but I really thought that match was really good. I don't know. I had a lot of fun with it. I thought it was a good pay per view. I would um just to give you the points, uh Zach Pullman had a good week. If Zach would have picked EO to win as opposed to EO being second most likely to win, he would have had a perfect week. So Zach ends up with five points. Nice job, two beer. Jason and Bill were some also rans with three points apiece. <laughs> Not very good. Oh, man. They, they fucked up my dream pick. That was going to be the one that was going to push me over. They fucked up your dream pick. Both of us had EO as the least likely to win, which in retrospect I probably would have done anyway. And then uh, yeah. I went I went with Gargano, um, which I probably would have done again anyway also. Um, but you know what? I think uh, unless there's anything else that you guys want to talk about, 
Oh, you know what? I do. Yeah. I do want to play this drop that I just recorded for it because it was. If you're on a Facebook or Twitter with us, uh, band from Ringside, friends of BFR on Facebook, uh, BFR Pod, BFR Bill, BFR Zach with an H, BFR JCB, BFR Lucha Chris, uh, who was supposed to be on the show today, but he got called in to work. We're going to have the triumphant return. Uh, you would have seen that one of my favorite moments in wrestling history actually happened, or one of my favorite calls, I could, I should say, is when during the backlot brawl when Morrow said this. <laughs> when the gal comes up and said, did somebody call for an Uber and Dream and Cold both look at her? <laughs> and then Morrow goes, did somebody call for an Uber? <laughs> I mean... I loved I loved the shit out of it. It cracked me up so much. But uh, you know what? Let's talk some Japanese wrestling. Let's get to that. Two counts. One, two, three. Two beer. What's a two count? Oh man, two count is a long time coming, guys. Hey man, we've we've got uh, June fifteenth. New Japan Cup starts. Uh, we have um, like a typical new japan cup but without fans right so uh this is going to be the first that we've seen from new japan pro wrestling since february which is crazy to me and also maybe a little bit re- of reason why i have such a general malaise with wrestling right now <laughs> like, each week i'm like uh, like think we've done like the takeover do over and we try to keep it fresh and stuff and thankfully we have the wednesday night wars but i mean without that i mean i there, there'd be a chance that i wouldn't even be watching wrestling right now but, right um, i mean you take away so, japanese wrestling and you take away booze and all of a sudden zach just doesn't <laughs> like wrestling anymore <laughs> i know right it's uh it's weird it's weird but um yeah so we're gonna start without fans but then i think they're going to ease into fans uh they're selling uh a couple thousand seats like a third capacity uh, in Kirk and Hall, I think it's Kirk and Hall that they're doing it. So um, as the month goes on, and then we're going to have Dominion. So like the finals and Dominion um, will have um, their like actual like fans, but it'll still be third capacity. But that'll be cool. Uh, also, a few years ago today, it's June 11th. Uh, so we had the great Okado Omega draw in mm. Dominion. So if you want to go back and relive some dominion before this new dominion uh that'll be fantastic you know watching but um but yeah you know new japan cup's always good it's different than the g1 so for those of you guys who are not familiar or maybe newer to new japan it's a 32 man single elimination tournament so it's just a huge 32 person bracket with a bunch of singles matches where eventually we have you know quarterfinals semifinals and finals so uh, some interesting matchups at the very beginning. We get uh, Kota Bushi, Zack Sabre Jr. on night one. So that's pretty awesome. Uh, and then there's Sho and Shingo Takagi, who had a fantastic match before this uh, pandemic. I um, can't remember if it was the best of the Super Juniors, maybe, where Chikagi and, or Takagi ended up going to the finals there with Will mm-hmm. Ospreay. I think, I think they had a match in that tournament that was phenomenal. So really kind of no accident that we're getting a repeat of that. Uh, we're going to get to see Okada and Gato. You know, they've got plenty of history, uh, but not a ton of craziness uh, at the beginning of this, but it's New Japan. There's always going to be upsets. There's always going to be surprises and there's always going to be like moments of greatness, uh, like unexpected greatness. Like you get like, you know, the big matches, I say Kota Bushi and Zack Sabre Jr. And, you know, Lonely Island's jizz in my pants starts playing in the background, but uh, <laughs> there's plenty of, like, other very solid workers in there, and we're going to get to see a lot of different faces, because I think it's, I think there's only about half of the competitors that are going to be in the original New, Cup, New Japan Cup bracket that actually are able to get into this bracket because of travel restrictions and stuff, so, like, guys like Juice Robinson are not making it back in the country, but you know, there's other guys that do like Gaijin that do live in Japan that are able to uh, stick around. So we're gonna we're gonna see some fresh faces and we're gonna see some Japanese wrestling. And I could not be happier. Yeah, we got Goto Takahashi in the first round. Also, um, 
For the first time ever, 13 of the 32 entrants in the New Japan Cup will be junior heavyweights. So that probably has to do with something that has to do with the travel restrictions that you were talking about. Slim Jason. Pickens. Yeah, Jason, what are you thinking? Um, I'm looking at the bracket right now, and like uh, Tubir said, uh, obviously Ibushi, Zack Sabre Jr. jumps off at you. Um, Tanahashi Taichi just above it. I think that's going to be a good match. I think that Taichi was getting a, a little push, and I think that in big matches like that one, he steps to the plate. He ultimately loses more times than that, but I think that would be a, a good match. Uh, Taguchi Sonata, I think that would be a solid match. Just looking on the opposite side, um, I see old Yano and Jado. That's going to be some goddamn shit show comedy bullshit. All a whole five minutes of that. Yeah, oh, I hope I hope it's like fifteen, seventeen minutes. Jesus Christ, that'd be even worse. <laughs> um, but yeah, this, now that you mentioned it, uh, I am seeing a lot of uh, the junior heavyweights, especially on the. I'll call it the Okada side of the bracket. Gabriel Kidd, Ishimori, um, Kanamaru. Saw one more, uh, El Desperado. So, yeah, that's just four that I'm just catching off the top of, of my head. So, I guess that's that's a good takeaway from it. It kind of sets up, at least on the Okada side, that it would be hard for him not to get to the finals. Uh, Suzuki is in his bracket, so I would probably suspect, unless Suzuki's an early upset, um, a Suzuki Okada looks like that would be a quarterfinal match. So, dude, we could get uh, Hiromu Okada in the finals. We or could the get finals. Yeah, finals. I was getting ready to say yeah, that. That's easily a possibility too. But I mean, it's it's good to have New Japan back. It's easily my favorite promotion in. A main reason I like it is they do their tournaments. And, you know, it's not like all the big names are here, but there's just enough to keep me interested, and that's always a good start. Like uh, Tucker said, there will be some upsets somewhere along the line. It's just a matter of, you know, trying to find that upset and and uh, pick it out. But if I had to guess right now, I'm saying this is Okada's tournament to lose. Um, I can't see maybe – Tanahashi on the opposite side, but yeah, I can't really see anybody beating Okada coming out of this New Japan Cup on the uh, the opposite side. Maybe maybe Zack Sabre Jr. That's a stretch. Abushi's a stretch. So yeah, if I had to guess right now, I like Kota Abushi to uh, not Kota Abushi. I like uh, Okada to win this whole thing. But it is New Japan, like I said, weirder shit has happened. You know, I'm I'm looking at this bracket also, and this might come as a surprise to anybody out there that's listening that has known me as a wrestling fan for a while. Somebody who has only been through, what, two G1s and, you know, three, three uh, Wrestle Kingdoms, you know, watching it, that New Japan, I'm, I'm with these two guys, New Japan is the best... It's the best wrestling out there. It's the one that I'm most excited about. Um, if you asked me if I had a, if I had an, like I like I said last year, G One's the actual WrestleMania for me. I fucking have fallen in love with G One. I was in Europe on vacation last year, and I was you know in Florence seeing the sights, and I was in Germany, and I was in Venice, you know, going down in the gondola with my bride, and I was wondering, <laughs> I, ooh, I wonder. I wonder who won that match last night between Zack Sabre Jr. and Osprey. <laughs> but it is, it it is, it's it's next level, and you know, I, I don't know if this is saying something about the culture or not. Japanese crowds are certainly different than American and European crowds, but for Jap for New Japan to go in front of no fans, it just doesn't seem like as big of a deal to me, just because. There's not there like if there's chance in a New Japan match, it's just like barely chance, and it seems like they're a little bit more, you know, they they wait for the big spots before they really start going crazy. Um, I hope that's not, I hope that's not racist. It just seems like that's the way it is. The third thing, you know, that, I, I was I was going to throw that out there and I cut you off real quick. I think that if there is a fan base, for lack of a better term, that could do this. 
it would be the Japanese fan base. They're much more respectful. It's an art form. It's like a movie to them. They'll shut the fuck up until it's time to start making some noise. So, I mean, I think that's a lot of the reason I like New Japan is for the in-ring action. It has very little to do with the crowd. So, I mean, in this scenario, I think we'll be okay. And the third thing I was going to say. You mean you don't need? You mean you don't need fans chanting "This is awesome" before the lockup to make a good match? Oh my god! <laughs> when I was watching, man, during that NXT takeover, during that Damian Priest Finn Balor match, when just all the jobber wrestlers standing around trying to make it seem like there's a crowd there, when they start chanting "Fight!" like a couple of people start chanting "Fight Forever!" like five minutes into it, it's like, guys, guys, shut the fuck up! Like, have you guys never actually been in the crowd? Um, the third thing that I was going to say about this is that we should have a ban for ringside, ban from ringside tournament bracket challenge. Treat it like it's the NCAAs. Everybody fill out their bracket. Get your bracket online on at, at VFR pod. Hit us up with your bracket, print it out, do whatever you got to do. And the winner, you know, wins a free Band from ringside shirt. Or you know what? Maybe a couple of band from ringside shirts because we have a couple to choose from. <laughs> right? <laughs> Don't you guys think that's a good idea? I was going to say maybe go to the website might be. Uh, oh yeah, more of a better option. Well, tell them about that, Jason. Just because it would be. I think if God forbid if we had like a bunch of entries or whatever, it'd be easier to to do it like that. But, yeah, you're right. Um, tell them about the website. Um, www.bandfromringside.life. Um, let's just go like that. We're going to, we'll put up a, a bracket so you can look at it. And then from that point, I just return the bracket back in. I believe the first matches start the 16th. So that gives you what? It gives you five, days? five days to do it. It's the 11th today. It's the 11th today. God, I'm still off. Okay, so yeah, that, that should be more than enough time. Just send them in. We'll just do it like uh, Bill said. We'll do a, an NCAA-type tournament. We'll just do single-point winners. Uh, what do we want to do for a tiebreaker just in case of uh, same number of points? I'd say uh, for listeners, they have to name who their favorite BFR podcaster is, and if they get it right, <laughs> then... They're the winner, so that means when everybody that means when everybody puts down JCB, that the one person who puts Zach or Bill is actually going to win. Right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So okay. So let's just do it like that. I'll put the bracket up tonight, and then from that point, you'll have until the 16th to get the just bracket back starts, in, yeah. and then we'll just go from there. We'll just we'll keep up. A, uh, we'll do like a top five tally sheet of you know the top five leading point getters from the start and then you know we'll just go from there winner gets a couple of t-shirts and then from that point you know we'll, you can slide into the bfr dms for mailing information sizes all that good shit but yeah i like the idea let's do it yeah let's do it i mean for everybody that's been missing sports i mean it's like sports uh so looking for the new japan cup Oh my god, I wish that we were talking about actual matches from New Japan because now I'm pretty psyched for uh I'm pretty psyched for this. But we got other stuff to get to. Let's get to that. Three counts. One, two, three. All right, we had the Wednesday night wars last night. Um I thought that it was a couple of Good shows, maybe not great shows. Uh, maybe AEW. AEW was pretty good. Um, so AEW started off with a real banger of a match. I mean, it wasn't a five star classic, but man, it was nonstop. And it was uh, FTR, the formerly known as the Revival, versus the Butcher and the Blade. FTR and going and FTR ended up going over in about ten minutes. Uh, what you think of that match, Zach? I, I agree with you. It was a total banger. Really elevated Butcher and Blade. Definitely their best match that I've seen them wrestle. And it was not just because of the Revival or FTR, but it was so nice 
to see FTR back doing what FTR does. They are absolute pros. And like I said last week, it is so nice and refreshing to have a wrestling show start out with a just professional wrestling match at the beginning with no commercial interruptions. Like, we got to see 10 minutes of tag team wrestling. Xander apparently loved it. (laughs) I don't know how you can hear that. Like, I turned my mic off. Oh, it's louder than literally any anything else all day. But uh, yeah, he was. Uh, that, this is awesome to cat speak. But right, it was, it was great. Um, I, I I really dug it. Um, I'll piggyback on that. The only thing I didn't like about it was the ending where you had Sabian and Jimmy Havoc come in and attack the baby faces that just seemed random to me i mean it was pretty contrived just to be able to get omega and page the the revival the end game and yeah i i totally see it that looks like a bill vaggy special waiting to happen oh yeah that part dude it just seemed like the team is i guess i have the problem with okay by the way they have they have a name now jason I know, and I can't forget. I can't remember what the name is. They're the Super Bad Death Squad. Yeah, yeah. That's That's a mouthful. Yeah, that's what I was saying. It was just a little much to remember right right off the jump. Plus, they just named it the last night or whatever. I wrote it down. I I, I, I like that they have a team name, at least. No, I I have no problem with that. It makes my life easier. Dude, Um, that three-way that you mentioned, though, like, like we got the best tag team, arguably the best tag team match of all time with Young Bucks and Omega Page. You throw the Revival in the mix, baby, you got Stu going. Yeah, I was going to say, as much as I don't want to, I kind of don't want to see it, I think that would, it would be hard not to go that route. Maybe a, a singles match between FTR and Omega, and then somehow you can weave the Bucks in, but it would just, it's going to be hard to get away away from that match it really is just as an aside zach when you just said that were you was that a reference to carl weathers in arrested development it it absolutely was yeah (laughs) okay good (laughs) (laughs) okay uh coming up next uh we had we had a backstage with the natural nightmares i get there i guess there's some beef going in between uh brandy and Allie. Allie, who's actually isn't she actually married to somebody else? She's married to the Blade, yeah. which is why she was the bunny. But there's been no explanation of why she's not the bunny anymore and why she's, like, shacking up with QT Marshall. Okay. Uh, so I think I think the thing is that Brandy thinks Allie's, like, a spy for the Butcher and the Blade. She doesn't trust her, which, I mean, is totally reasonable because we have zero explanation. Um, because QT Marshall seems like a really cool dude. Seems like he does a really good job training people at his wrestling school because a lot of these jobbers that we see on these shows uh, are all from his school and they all do really, really well. Um, so he seems like a good wrestling teacher. But Ali, a little out of his league. Just, just saying. <laughs> hey, bro. He is out kicking his cover. Hey, bro. Sure. And- hey, bro. I've seen your okay. wife. Um- <laughs> yeah, wow. I know, right? It's like the. It's like the pot cuddle coming on the cuddle black. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we had Hikaru Shida and Statlander versus uh, Penelope Ford and Nyla Rose. I mean, it was fine. Anything to say about that? No, I, I actually oh, Ford, like this match. Ford getting a win. Yeah. yeah. That's surprising. No, I won't say it's surprising. I, I think that, I mean, realistically, we've kind of, you know, ran through what is the typical top four or top five of the women's division at some point, minus Britt Baker, obviously she's hurt. Penelope Ford, Penelope Ford makes sense in this scenario. She's not beating Sheeta. I just think that this is a good chance for her to get herself over and then, you know, a year, two years down the line, maybe she can become champion there. But this, it makes sense, one, and I thought the match was good, too. Uh, I, I got to be honest, the because AEW's women's division got off to such a rocky start, I feel like I'm still not completely into it. Not like I am with NXTs. You know what I mean? Is that is that wrong? Am I missing something? 
No, I don't, I don't think you're missing anything. I think I think they had a plan when they first initially wanted to do this, and I think Two Beer actually said it, and it was centered around uh, Kaylee Ray. And once that kind of fell through, uh, Kylie Ray left. Um, B Priestley is basically stardom. Um, we haven't seen Rio in a little bit. So, I mean, it's it's a moving part division. It's not completely stable yet. So I kind of get where you're going with that. There's nobody that – I shouldn't say nobody. Maybe for you there's nobody that you can really get behind and and – invest in or whatever the case may be. I like Hikaru Shida. Um, I mean, she's cool. No, Shida is a good start. It's just like I said, I think this is why Ali is a big deal breaking away from Butcher and the Blade. If there's a chance for her to get into the women's division and become a singles uh, competitor, this is as good as time as any because there's really no breakout superstar. There's a lot of good competitors, but there's no one quote-unquote, face of the division, at least in my opinion. Okay, uh, we had a little little segment there with uh, Jaboy, Darby Allen, and Tony Hawk. Uh, what you think about uh, your hero getting on the show there, Zach? Dude, I love Tony Hawk. <laughs> like, Do you really? I was making the joke. Tony Hawk. I know, right? I was like, how does he know this about me? I didn't. <laughs> we've, ne- we've never talked about it. No, we never have. Yeah. yeah. They're, uh, they're remastering. I-, I used to skateboard like 150 pounds ago, but uh, they uh, remastering Tony Hawk's Pro Skater uh, like the, for like a, like the old games or remastering them. Uh, anyway, Tony Hawk, totally stand up dude. And it was really cool to see him. Uh, and my boy, like you said, Darby Allen. That was a fun, you know, little like thing it showed up on the internet a few days ago but it was nice that they put it on dynamite you know we got time there's pandemic you know throw some cool stuff up there yeah definitely and uh you know i I, i've done an ollie and a couple kickflips in my time i was never a big skater but i will say that tony hawk on twitter seems to be one of the coolest celebrities out there so uh yeah i'm pro him i still i like him better than darby allen i think tony hawk should go over um so (laughs) Tony Hawk's like the John Cena of wrestling. They even have the same amount of letters in their first and last names. It's weird. Uh, we have Hager, Santana, and Ortiz versus Best Friends and OC. It seemed like this was a you know a good time filler with a bunch of good workers. It looked like we were trying to get to the inner circle beating down the Best Friends and Orange Cassidy, and it really looks like we're getting to a Jericho-Orange Cassidy match which makes sense to me because Orange Cassidy is really popular. I, I I do think that they should wait for this match until it's in front of a crowd because the AEW crowd will absolutely go fucking bananas for this match. What do you think, JCB? No, I agree with that totally. I think that's definitely going to happen. Um, I think this is, and I'm not sure when this is going to happen, purely speculation on my part, but I think this is a, a possible precursor to a trios title, six man title, whatever you want to call it. But yeah, I think Orange Cassidy and Jericho's a lot for Fighter Fest. It's just a matter of time when they announce it. Uh, you just you don't do this spot. Uh, you don't have the oranges hidden underneath the the ring for <laughs> no apparent reason. I think it's a setup for that match. I, I I would love to see it in front of fans, but I mean I think this is going to be a more just entertaining enough to where you don't need fans. It's going to get off on its own. I, I agree. Like uh, with Bill, because I feel like it would be so transcendent with fans, right? But like JCB said, it's hard. It's hard to wait, and I, it doesn't like necessarily need it. But I, am I the only one? I didn't see anybody online or anything. Was anybody else like kind of uncomfortable? Like, or am I just being like a total like I don't know what's about this? I've seen a lot of videos of people being like beaten this week and uh the orange cassidy being beat with a baseball bat was like a little tone deaf to me uh, i didn't love it like i did it just brought up too much like real shit oranges is one thing bag oranges is, like kind of silly but like you got hit with a bat and like bled i don't know am i like totally an asshole about that uh, i mean i guess it's just what you bring to it to, to me like wrestling it's just so wrestling in general is just so much like fun for lack of a better word 
that it's hard for me unless it's it, if it was some if it was if they were saying something that was borderline then I would find it tone deaf. But in terms of like beating up people, I mean, wrestling's so cartoonish that it never really that that I, I watched it live and that never popped in my head. And I've watched, I've been online, I've been extremely online for the last couple of weeks too, watching all the fucking videos. But no, I mean, but if that's what you bring to it, I mean, I wouldn't call you yeah, a I mean, pussy or anything. I didn't think it was, yeah, I didn't think it was like offensive or like anything. It was just you know like. That happened, and then uh, Jim Ross is like, oh, he's bleeding out the ears, and I just immediately think of this Buffalo protester, you know, 75-year-old man, like, bleeding out of the ears, like, laying on the ground as National Guards step over him, like, uh, oh, if I, just too much. I miss Jim Ross saying that. If I would have heard, if I would, if I would have caught that, and who knows, maybe I was looking at my phone or something, if I would have caught that, then I would, like, bleeding out of your ears definitely makes me, just, just saying that makes me think about the old guy in Buffalo. You're right about that. Um we got to keep it moving. Uh, Guevara versus Colt Cabana had a bunch of, I mean, it was kind of a newsworthy match. One, because as Zach said last week, or maybe two weeks ago, Sammy Guevara is really coming into his own and is super entertaining and has benefited probably the most of standing next to Chris Jericho for a while because when Matt Hardy came out after he beat Colt Cabana, Guevara's like, turn this idiot's music off, and it, it was just, he's really comfortable being a dickhead heel, and also, Colt Cabana looks like he's going with the Dark Order. Uh, thoughts on that, Jason? Um, agree with everything you said about Sammy Guevara. I think, like I said on online last night, I think he's going to be one of the future building blocks of AEW. Um, I'm not going to say when he's going to be champion, but I think he will be world heavyweight champion at some point down the line. Um, Cole Cabana is a, is a good start for the Dark Order. They need some sort of momentum now that they're apparently all back together in that full strength. I think this is as good as time as any to get a conversion that's not enhancement talent. Um, Cole Cabana is a, a, enough of a name that if he did convert to the Dark Order, that would be a start. It's not, you know, anything earth shattering, but it's a, a step in the right direction where I think the whole group kind of needs some momentum after the Brody Lee loss at uh, Double or Nothing. Zach? Yeah, uh, this kind of exemplifies one thing that I like about AEW that we don't really talk about as much. Uh, you know, we talk about young stars and, you know, like Sammy and stuff going over and you're getting over but one thing that they do really well is they will book like four outcomes or like incidences in like one scene right there'll be like one one match but like it spins off like four storylines or like resolves like multiple storylines and they're they're able to like get multiple people over and get multiple things done in a very timely manner and i think that's why they can have two hours a week and still managed to get all these guys over. There are uh, so had, many like, there are so many wrestlers on AEW from week to week that are over. It's like they keep so many balls in the air that it's just it's just fucking impressive. That's the only that's the only way to say it, you know? Yeah. Uh so what do you, what's the over under on the Sammy face turn? I feel like that's gotta be whenever fans come too, right? But uh, uh, I feel like that's like a thing. Yeah, I mean, it, uh, we're worried a while for that. I don't, I don't see that happening at least for the, in 2021 at the very least. But and I'm being generous. I think Sammy is going to have a nice ass heel run for a little bit. Talk to me when we start getting some fractures in the uh, the inner circle. But um, you know, to Zach's point, the next segment was a Joey Janela vignette, and Joey mm-hmm. Janela was sitting at a bar talking about how just six months ago he was fighting Moxley in the main event, and now it looks like he's been completely left behind. And that is the way that you have a guy that might seem to smarks like you and I like he's been left behind. But if you acknowledge it with a vignette, if you just give the guy one vignette, you can leave him off TV for a couple weeks and have him have these vignettes, and then when he comes back, he's still over. 
You know what I mean? It was just, I, I was watching, when I watched that Joey Janela thing, and he's like, man, it was just six months ago. I was in the main event. I was like, man, that's perfect. That is so good because it's it's like a juggler, you know? Like, th- then, they're, then they're keeping that ball in the air also while all this other stuff is going on, on the other side, right? No, I agree with that, Joey. Uh, and I think that was kind of one of the, maybe the ongoing criticisms with AEW is, you know, they can't sign all this talent. They, they are not going to be able to get guys over, keep guys over, whatever the case may be. I'll say this. That was one of the more intriguing vignettes that I've seen in a while, just because, like you said, the first words out of his mouth was six months ago, I was main event with Moxley. Yeah, was, man. Yeah, he was. That was a good match. Yes, and it was awesome. Now, <clears throat> and now, you know, six months later, he's basically off AEW uh, radar altogether. And, and it's kind of like, you know, well, you know, why is that? You know, then, then you start asking yourselves, well, at least I ask myself, you know, why is that? You know, is it, it's because of the pandemic. It's because he's got his own wrestling company, you know, multiple, you know, factors that can go into it. Ultimately, it got me leading back to thinking about Joey Janela and putting him back onto my radar. And I think ultimately that's what they wanted to do. Job well done. Uh, up next, we have John Moxley cutting a promo in the parking lot, which is uh, such a professional, perfect <laughs> John Moxley promo. I love this segment because Taz, he was talking shit about Taz. Taz is off camera and starts yelling at John Moxley like he heard him talking shit. And then you hear Taz running over, and then Taz gets in Moxley's face, and then Cage comes out of nowhere and, you know, clotheslines him from behind, throws him into a car. It was a perfect segment. You guys talk about this segment while I go take a piss. Go ahead, Tuvier. You got it. Uh, Yeah, it definitely, you know, did a good job of continuing to heat up this feud. I definitely want to see John Moxley get after Brian Cage more now than I did last week, right? And that's kind of the whole point. Like, you don't just have these holder things because, oh, we have to have a segment with these guys because they're going to have a match. Like, you have to actually do something with that segment. And I think that's what a lot of times is missing. And I don't want to turn this into like a WWE bashing thing, but like, a lot of times, you know, yeah, just, right. the WWE shit just seems stale because it's like, oh, we have this segment because they're going to have a match, but, like, the segment might not make sense, or it's just, like, generic or whatever, and it's just, like, a maybe a tag match with, like, you know, some other people, but they don't really do it as well as, like, New Japan does. Like, New Japan can have a tag match with people that are going to have a singles match later on, mm-hmm. and somehow it just elevates that tag match to make it must-see wrestling. You know, you can't right. skip the undercard because these guys are going to be on it. Um, it's just, uh, you know, like K- Brian Cage like, was going to power bomb him on the goddamn concrete. And instead of doing that, Taz talked him out of it and he threw him through a windshield, you know, and it was like, it looked real and it seemed realistic. And, you know, it was cool. No, I think that's, I think part of the reason why I'm getting into this feud a little more than just Brody Lee, just because that was the most recent feud that he had is one is they're, they have more time to kind of, build this feud up where Moxley, even though he's been kind of dominant for lack of a better term, you know, leading to winning the title and winning the title and moving forward afterwards. But I mean, this is the first time we've really kind of seen Moxley get thrown around physically, you know, where he looks Moxley is kind of a big guy, but Brian Cage looks bigger, and he started to physically manhandle him a little bit. Yeah, that's Cage is way my, bigger than Moxley. That's where my intrigue comes into it, to where, you know, he could have powerbound him, like you said, and he didn't. You know, he did throw him through the uh, the rearview mirror or whatever the case may be, uh, you know, slammed him on the, the hood of the car. This is one of those times where now I feel like I didn't, think that Brody Lee would win just because of how it's set up to lead to this match. Now leading to Fighter Fest, I'm kind of, you know, I don't know, Moxley might lose this bad boy. So I mean ultimately that's kind of what I was I'm looking for is to have me guess on whether Moxley is going to lose or not. And as it stands right now, I mean Brian Cage has come in and they pushed him strong. They made him look strong. Taz is a great voice box for him. 
the segment was done really, really well. I mean, you can nitpick it if you want to. It's in a parking lot, but it's in a parking lot for a reason. Why? Because Ryan Cage is going to beat down the champ and throw him against a, you know, a car or two. So, I mean, it, you know, you can nitpick if you want to. For me, it worked. Um, Cody fought uh, Mark Quinn. Am I saying that right? Mm-hmm. Um, he beat him. Uh, it was a good match. Mark Quinn got the out with uh, his injury. Jake Hager comes down. He attacks Arn Anderson. And then there's a schmoz. And you guys know my biggest criticism mm-hmm. of AEW is that every single show has to end with a schmoz. It's very WCW. Any thoughts on that? We have about 17 minutes left before we got to get out of here. Um, I will say this, and I'll eat my words a little bit. I get now why Cody is the champion, because if you're going to have matches like this, and I'm not saying that the match was bad, but undercard, mid-card guys, uh, guys from tag team that are going to challenge Cody, you're going to have to make them look good, and the match has to look good as well. Cody is the guy to do it. If Lance Archer was the champion, he would be in a position where he'd have to destroy guys. And if he didn't do that, then we'll wonder what's wrong with Oh, Lance hell no. So, I mean, upon retrospect, I'll eat my words a little bit. Cody's probably the, the better guy to be the champion if this is the way you want the championship to – his championship reign to look. You know what I just heard, Zach? Guys over, oh, that's sure. the guy to do it. You know what I just heard, Zach? Thank you. <laughs> what's that? You know what I just heard? What's that? I just heard Jason say that Zach should book the territory. Ooh, I'll take it. I'll take it. Cold no, it, it, it was a good match. It, I like the way that the, the match ended with the, I guess, Indian death lock on the ankle or whatever. Um, Cody kind of so, showed his heelish side a little bit, which made it easier to kind of root, root for Mark Quinn. Okay, um, when the smiles is the smiles. It is what it is. Yeah, but I it doesn't it. have to end every single dynamite. Uh, no, Zach, I agree. I agree. Zach, before we move on to NXT, yeah, the just real quick, uh, dynamite is the new nitro, and nitro ended in the smiles. It's like nitro with way better booking. So, but some things are still the same. Hey, there were some nitros that had some pretty good booking. I'll go to bat for that. Uh, let's move on to NXT. Really, there was only a few newsworthy things here, um, and because we don't have a whole lot of time, because that's my bad, everybody. Uh, I fucked up trying to get these guys on the phone. Uh, Grimes versus no, Balor. Yeah, I ain't much to talk about. Uh, Gr- Grimes versus Balor. That Cameron Grimes, he shows flashes of brilliance, and the last five minutes of every single one of his matches is really great. I like that a lot. I was surprised that Finn Balor called out Keith Lee at the end rather than Adam Cole. That got addressed later on with the carrying cross thing. What do you think, Zach? Yeah, just overall, um, there was, like, some decent, like, some good and some bad. But, yeah, uh, that makes sense. Carrying cross is going to be that next guy. I really think he's taking up with Cole. Like I said before, um, Grimes, uh, you know, Balor. Balor got his win back. We knew that was coming whenever they booked the match. It's just WWE, even though it's NXT, it's got to be 50-50. Um, and, yeah, Balor calls out Lee, which, you know, uh, is another example of what I just talked about. So I don't know, even though those guys are both great, I don't know how good of a match it will be. Um, we'll just see, like, what the dynamic is, what the story is. Maybe Balor takes it, and maybe that's the, the difference. Maybe it's a more aggressive match with weapons i don't know i just don't that little david and goliath work as a story like and lasted like the test of time like for a reason because uh goliath was the heel i'm just like, not sure balor's a heel right now but may, maybe i'm wrong i think he is do no, you I think, I think he is. is and i think it's easier for him to be a heel without fans i think if there was fans it would be harder for him to be a heel but i think he's definitely a heel right now what do you think jason um camera grimes i think is is a perfect example of what a, the North American title is, is supposed to be. And I think at some point he'll get that um, just to piggyback on the Keith Lee, uh, Finn Bauer, uh, I'm assuming title match at some point down the line. I think that'd be a good idea. I, th- I just think that Finn Bauer's character isn't a, the Johnny Gargano heel character. This heel character, Finn Bauer is much more aggressive 
and I think that will play into the match a little more and make it a better match. Okay, I'm going to say something too about the real quick about Keith Lee. Sure. Uh, that opening tag match, you know, we had like a great opening tag match in AEW, and then NXT opens with a tag match yeah. that literally should have happened last week. Like, Thank what the hell you. is that? I, I don't know. That's I didn't even want to bring it up because uh, it was. I, I didn't even want to bring it up. Um, okay, I'm going to ask you for one word, okay? Just one word. And you guys always seem to have a problem with this, but it's just one word. Um, <laughs> if Karrion Cross takes the belt off of Adam Cole, who is his next challenger? Chopper. Uncertain. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to say two words, Keith Lee. Okay, uh, so, see, I just broke my own rules. I think the biggest newsworthy event, I mean, in terms of, like, we actually had a, a, a pretty basic, but basic isn't always bad, a pretty good heel turn from El Hijo del Fantasma um, on Drake Maverick when you find out that uh, he's been behind the uh, the kidnapping ninjas. And for those of you that listen that just are fans of us and don't really watch that much wrestling, that's what makes wrestling great because there were kidnapping ninjas. It all ended up being uh, either African-American or Hispanic. Uh, it was Raul Mendoza and Joaquin Wild, uh, the previously known as Zima Ion over there in TNA Impact. And Phantasma revealed himself to be, uh, uh, you know, speaking English without an accent rather than just speaking uh, Spanish the whole time. Uh, what you guys think of the turn? I think they pulled it trigger too early. I think they should have had Phantasma playing both characters before he eventually pulled off his mask to realize for the fans to realize that he was the same person, right? I think he should have played the mastermind without the mask and played the baby face like, you know, with a mask, right? What did I tell you, Jason? Let him book the territory. <laughs> uh, no, I, honestly, I'm just mad that I got worked with the whole Drake Maverick thing, so I caught myself kind of like, you know, good for the heels type of deal. You know what I'm saying? I, I know we're supposed to boo him, but I caught myself, you know, yeah, kick him again, kick him again. You know, <laughs> if we're going to make Drake Maverick going to be, you know, the sympathetic figure, then, you know, he needs his ass kicked for fooling my, my black ass. Jason, ass down. it's the mantra of the show. I know, I know. It's I our slogan. Cheer. I didn't cheer. You have to I adhere. Just, I just smiled, okay? Oh, I got a little no. joy of watching Drake Maverick get beat down. Sue me. I'm not going to see you. Okay, that's going to do it for our... Th- you know what? I will see you. Oh, for what? <laughs> Sorry, I should... You know, if you guys were sitting here, you guys would have seen that I was getting ready to drop. Do a drop, because I just did a... Hold on, don't say anything. You know what? I will sue you. Oh, hell no. Okay. All right, Jason. Fine, I won't. Uh, so, that's going to do it for our three counts. <laughs> <laughs> you said, oh, hell no. Um, okay, we got Backlash predictions. Backlash 2020, everybody knows it's one of the big uh, one of the big seven pay-per-views of the year for WWE. Not counting takeovers. <laughs> um, so, uh, I, I just want you guys to know, I've already written down all my answers. So there's no hedging. I should have been doing this the whole time. I don't even know why I haven't been doing it. But uh, we're going to start off with the uh, women's tag team title match. Uh, Zach, can you name who the women's tag team title holders are right now? Uh, Bailey and Sasha. And I'm Unbelievable. 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 Good for you. Okay, so we got Bailey and Sasha versus the Iconics versus Alexa Bliss and Nikki Cross. Least to most, Zach. Bailey and Sasha. I'm oh, sorry, least to most. Okay. Yeah. Um, least is iconic. The middle will be Cross and Bliss, and then Bailey and Sasha retain. Jason, uh, I'm gonna switch it. Um, least I have uh, Bliss 
and Nikki Cross. I think this is the time to break them up if there is a chance for Alexa Bliss to have a singles run. This is it. I'm going iconic second just because of the NXT title match. Uh, it's baby faces waiting on the winner. So that feels like it needs to be a, a heel champion. But I think this might be the time that Sasha actually retains a title. I'm taking Sasha and Bailey to retain. All right, I'm switching it up on you guys. We all we, we all have different picks here. This barely ever happens. I have Alexa Bliss and Nikki Cross least, Sasha Banks and Bailey second least, and I'm picking the Iconics because I didn't think that Io Shirai was going to win, and I got burned. I think that the Iconics aren't going to win, but the Iconics have held it before, and I also think now is the time to put it on somebody else. Bliss and Cross have had forever. And I also think that Sasha Banks and Bailey are going, this is the beginning of their split, and they're going to fight at SummerSlam. That's my prediction. Coming up next, uh, we have Jeff Hardy versus Sheamus. Zach, can you tell me what this feud is about? Um, I'm going to guess that it is a fight for the whitest male on the roster. That's a forfeit, though, bro. Okay, uh, no, it's not actually. Um, Seamus oh, staged a car shit. accident and poured a bunch of booze on Jeff Hardy, so he got arrested by the cops, and everybody thinks he's relapsed, even though he has not actually relapsed. Um, I'll oh, go yeah, first. It, it always works so well to bring addiction angles uh, into wrestling whenever the people actually have addiction, because we have a history where that's worked out 100% fine every time. Love a good addiction angle. I'm taking Jeff Hardy. Uh, who you got, JCB? I would agree, Jeff Hardy. Who you got, Zach? Um, man, I'm gonna take Seamus. All right, and then we got. Uh, I nothing about this view. I was getting ready to say, watch him get this trick right. I'm I know he's going to. Uh, we have Apollo Cruz versus Andrade, who won a triple threat match against Kevin Owens and Angel Garza on Raw. Apollo Cruz versus Andrade for the U.S. title. Go ahead, Jason. Um, Black Lives Matter. I'm taking Apollo Cruz. I am taking Apollo Cruz. Also, who you got, Zach? I got Apollo Cruz, and this honestly looks like the only match worth watching on the entire page. I'll tell you what, man. Apollo Cruz. Both these guys are impressive as fuck. Apollo Cruz is an insane, insane athlete, man. Just yeah, this should be the most athletic match of the night. Oh my god, it's not. Oh, you don't think it's going to be Braun versus uh, Morrison and Miz? Braun versus Morrison and Miz for the belt in a handicap match. We don't have to spend a whole lot of time on this. I took Braun Strowman. Is anybody and, not taking Braun? Yeah, I was getting ready to say that. That's probably the better choice of words. I'll just say this. I, I thought this would be a better build than what it has been. I mean, it's a shitty match. I at least want to be entertained on the way up to this shitty match. And, you know, we've gotten what we had last week. I mean, I, I'm over it, man. Bring the feedback. Give me somebody. I don't care at this point. Yeah, it was terrible. Dude, we never had co-champions. Like, I mean, like, never once. Like, why do they think that we're going to believe that there's going to be co-champions. No, like, there have been value. co-champions before. I for just the, for the main heavyweight belt? champion. Yes, because we've had we've had this conversation. Uh, we need to get our stack guy on it. We shouldn't have laid him off because of the pandemic. No shit. I Hold on. I have to disagree. I was going to say the women's title I think was shared by like Play Cool or whatever, but I don't think the men's title has been shared by two guys. I'm sure I'll be corrected on Twitter by everybody that fucking hates me. Uh, Asuka versus Jax. You know what? I don't care if they hate me. I I love me, okay? Um, Asuka versus Jax. I'm going Asuka. I'm going Asuka, but I also predict that she gets injured. God damn, dog. Wait. Oh, Jesus Christ. You mean kayfabe or not kayfabe? Not kayfabe. Like, cold she's getting blood. taken out. I mean, you just got a cold-blooded. Uh, <laughs> damn, yeah, I'm taking, I'm taking Oscar, too. I don't think that Oscar's going to get hurt. I think somewhere, hopefully, she comes out of this unscathed and Charlotte is the next opponent for Oscar. Jason, will you agree with me that if Oscar gets hurt, we give Zach another point. If 
Oscar gets hurt, which Zach gets another point. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have Drew McIntyre versus Bobby Lashley. Who you got, Zach? For the belt. Drew. For for the belt. You got Drew? Yep. Jason Cornelius Bell. Jason yeah, Cornelius Bell, here's Cornelius. where the rubber hits the road. Do black lives actually matter? <laughs> <laughs> well played. Well played. Yes, they do, but in this case... No, they don't. I'm taking Drew McIntyre to retain. <laughs> but in this case, a white woman. <laughs> but in this case, no, they yeah, don't. But, yeah, but, well, allow me to be the racist of the group with me with the white girlfriend. I just, it's good to see Bobby Lashley hey, being in the. Hey, Zach and I both have white wives. So what? What you try to say that I'm not going to marry this woman? You try to embarrass me out here? What the fuck? Who? <laughs> yeah, I'm putting some pressure on you. Yeah, I'm putting some pressure yeah, on you, man. Shit, dude. <laughs> I say this room got hot all of a sudden. <laughs> not a, not over here, man. I'm cool as fuck over here. Uh, okay, so we got Edge and Orton in the. It's it's just baffling to me that they're that they are billing this as the greatest match of all time. Like it's just so fucking strange to me. And that's when I realized that's why they're not having AJ Styles versus Daniel Bryan on the same card. They're going to have it on SmackDown because if you put AJ right. Styles and Daniel Bryan on the same card as Edge and Orton and call the Edge and Orton match the greatest match of all time, it, it would just look silly. Um, I'll go first. I think that we're on our way to a rubber match at SummerSlam. I am taking Randy Orton and then Edge is going to just go further down the line of doubting himself. I did like the Christian and Edge segment on Raw, though. Uh, Jason, what do you think? Um, I did not watch Raw this week. I guess I'll watch it at some point. Um, it was a good Andrew segment. Was it was on. it was a good segment. Like, Christian starts, like, fucking with him and being like, you don't have it, and, like, Edge actually starts getting pissed at him. And then Christian's like, yeah, that's what we need. We know you got that's him. That's what I need, yeah. Okay. I, so love, I love Christian. No, I think Christian is underrated and, and should be in the Hall of Fame I do for too. his own singles career. But that's I agree. another story for another time. I agree with you on this. I see it a tiebreaker at some point. The only re- way we get a tiebreaker is Randy wins the stri- quote unquote straight up wrestling match. So I'll take Randy Orton. Uh, Zach. Yeah, I agree. This is the, the dumbest like idea, though. Uh, I'm pretty sure. Just- if they didn't put the step, well, not even the step, the title of that greatest match ever, I, I yeah, would, would be, be a, little, I would be a little more, you know, less likely to shit on. It. But I mean, you got to do sure. something really, really good at this point for me to even. Well, put it's this just in the. It's just baffling. Oh, it's it's so stupid. Like, what if Art? What if Randy Orton goes out there? Oh my God! I think I just figured it out. I think Randy Orton's going to go out there and he's just going to RKO him and it's going to be over. No, it's going to be the stop. curtain jerker. The finger pull could do. Stop. Going to be the Everyone. curtain. Going to be the curtain jerker, man. Stop. That's the main event. You know it. No, yeah, it's definitely going to be the main event. But something weird's going to happen. There's no reason they would call it this unless something weird was going to happen. It's not just going to be some 12 minute shit Randy Orton no, match. They've all, no, they've already filmed it, so I mean, it's in the bucket. So, is this a, so whatever it's happened, it's happened. I just don't. You're sure they've I've already seen, filmed it? They've already. I read it, it on yeah. Facebook. Yeah, as I say, I, I thought they did. They already oh, filmed it. Hell no. Two beers agreeing with me, so I'm only be inclined to, to say that they have filmed it. It's in the bucket, like I said. Oh, because two beer agrees is, with you. Yeah. Huh. <laughs> if you agreed with me, it's still two against one. So I mean, ultimately, it doesn't matter. My point is, is that I'm like one of the few that like the last man standing match, at least in this group of the three of us. Yes, me, you now, are the only one that liked that. To, okay, so that's what I'm saying. For this to be the quote greatest match ever, it did not suck. Um, it would have to surpass that. So, I mean, I thought that was good. That means it has to be, you know, X plus one better than that match. For you guys, it's probably X plus 100. So, I mean, they did themselves no favors by putting the greatest match ever label on it. They did no favors by bringing in Ric Flair, HBK, 
Kurt Angle, guys that could have a legitimate claim Bro. to a greatest match ever match. Bro. You know what I'm saying? Sonya Deville. They set it all up for them to really have to go balls to the wall. If not, they, it's going to be a fail. Sonya Deville and Lacey Evans had a 13-minute match on SmackDown last week. I didn't watch it. Really good. It was really better. Good. It was better than the Orton <laughs> Edge WrestleMania nah. match. Hey, guys, we got a bunch of nah. birthdays this week. Uh, Hika- oh, hold on a second. Banned from ringside. Hey, hey, guys, we have a bunch of birthdays this week. Hikaru Shida is 32. Mark Henry is 49. Jerry Lynn is 57. Virgil is 58. Chuck Palumbo is 49. Uh, he played basketball at Central Missouri State, I believe. Bailey is 31. Ultimate Warrior is 61. The Sandman is 57. Razor is 26. And Jungle... Boy is 23. God bless America. Hey, everybody. We know there's a ton of podcasts for you guys to listen to. <laughs> so we appreciate you guys listening to ours for F&B Eatery. Check. For Millie and Xander the Cats, who are both staring at me right now. Check, check. For Zach Bowman. For Jason Cornelius Bell, for Bo Geesman, a.k.a. Vice, I'll see you Saturday out on the links, bud. Uh, And hey, everybody, Black Lives Matter, support your local restaurants, support your local wheel dealer, and boo the heels! Boo!